Pumpkin has been an American obsession for a very long time. Like, always. But probably not in the way you've been taught. Take pumpkin pie, a Thanksgiving tradition, right? All those cute little drawings of the first Thanksgiving where pumpkin pie was being passed around the table? Yeah, no. You would have been just as likely to see a pumpkin spice latte. For so many reasons. You can't even get past the crust without running into issues. Flour was impossibly luxurious for colonists, and they weren't exactly running dairy farms, so butter was a rare treat. So no, pumpkin pie as we understand it today was a distant dream. But pumpkins were a very important part of the American fall diet, and were very much appreciated by colonists and natives alike. In the late 1670s, the first pumpkin dish was recorded to paper. It was a boiled pumpkin mash with butter and spices added, and though far from how we treat pumpkin today, it was the first step towards America's most treasured fall tradition. So when did cooks truly start discovering pumpkin's sweet and spicy potential? Well, it took about a century, but eventually, some genius discovered what would eventually evolve in today's pumpkin pie. But boy, did it look different than what you might expect. See, most cooking was still done over an open fire. So something as difficult to construct and bake as a pie crust was still impractical. But eggs and milk were now readily available, so a custard filling was an option. Especially if it was sweetened with something like maple syrup or honey, since sugar, though available, was impractically expensive. So how did someone manage to bake a pumpkin pie with no crust over an open fire? Well, like every home cook in history, by cleverly using what they had on hand. See, some genius realized that if they scooped the seeds out of a pumpkin, they could pour a custard right into it and bake the whole thing over an open fire. How amazing is that? The pumpkin baked through and steamed the sweet custard at the same time, making for a luxurious treat without even using a baking dish. There is no actual recorded recipe for this dish, but as someone who is obsessed with vintage cooking, I could not resist trying to make this dish for myself. So I experimented a bit and came up with something that I think is somewhat close to what they would have created back then. Of course, I added a few modern tweaks, like spices that would not have been practical then. And I baked it in an oven instead of over an open fire. But I found the entire process fascinating and was so impressed and humbled, as I often am when I cook old recipes, by how resourceful and clever these cooks were. It really was the most unique and special dish I have ever baked, and I highly recommend it if you are interested in historic cooking at all. I can share the full recipe, so just comment below if anyone is interested, and I will post it. So eventually, this pumpkin custard got wrapped in a buttery crust and became what we serve as a Thanksgiving tradition today. Very different from the original, but with the same appreciation for this seasonal treasure. And that's just pumpkin pie history. We were just getting started with our pumpkin obsession. I mean, who doesn't love a slice of sweet, moist pumpkin bread? And then there's pumpkin cobbler, of course, and pumpkin cake smothered in cream cheese frosting. So many pumpkin spice options you can bake at home. It's impossible to even list them all. So I'm making a few of my favorite pumpkin desserts that I found in my community cookbooks collection. After all, pumpkin has obviously been trending a very long time, so vintage cookbooks are the perfect place to find the very best recipes. The perfect pumpkin bread, a unique no-bake twist on a pumpkin pie with a praline crunch, an easy pumpkin cobbler, and a showstopper pumpkin cake roll. So if you love pumpkin spice and enjoy vintage recipes, you've come to the right place. So join me as I celebrate pumpkin spice season. Just the smell of it baking in the oven is enough to get me into the season. 
I don't care if the heat is still sticking around. When I get a sniff of sweet, spicy, tender pumpkin bread baking in the oven, I'm all in for pumpkin spice season. For me, there's nothing better, and a truly great pumpkin bread is a national treasure. Moist and earthy sweet from the pumpkin, flavorful and aromatic from all those rich spices, and tender for days after you bake it. It's absolutely perfect and apparently bakers have been obsessed with it for quite some time now. First developed in the 1800s, many cooks have treasured family recipes that have been passed down for generations so I knew vintage cookbooks would be the perfect place to find the perfect pumpkin bread recipe but even I was not prepared for just how many I would find. One cookbook alone had seven different recipes and each one had its own unique spin and take on this classic. So I spent more time than usual in the test kitchen baking loaf after loaf of pumpkin deliciousness. And after baking and tasting 16 loaves of pumpkin bread, I think I can confidently say I have found the perfect pumpkin bread recipe and I can't wait to share it with you. Denise Shapara shared it inside the Norris Choir Sister City Project Community Cookbook, and I think she absolutely cracked the code for pumpkin bread perfection. It's moist, but not soggy, sweet enough for dessert, but not too sweet to enjoy a slice for breakfast, and the unique cinnamon sugar sprinkle topping adds a fun texture that elevates it above any other loaf I've tasted. It tastes like something your grandma made and is sure to become a new annual tradition. To begin, Blend your dry ingredients together. Flour, baking soda, salt, cinnamon, nutmeg, and sugar. The recipe recommends sifting, but I just whisked mine and it came out perfectly. Now set that aside while you combine your wet ingredients. Eggs, cooked pumpkin, oil, and water. This recipe calls for salad oil, a common term you'll see in vintage recipes. It just means a mild flavored oil, so use your favorite. I had grapeseed oil on hand, so that's what I used. Once everything is well blended, combine the wet and dry ingredients. Blend them together a bit before adding a cup of chopped pecans and then finish mixing. Don't overmix the batter, as with most cake-like breads, the less you stir, the better. Interestingly enough, the recipe calls for the bread to be baked in two greased 9 by 5 inch pans, so that's what I used. I think it would do fine in loaf pans, you just might need to adjust the bake time a bit Maybe drop the baking temperature by a few degrees to make sure it doesn't burn the edges. Or, like me, stick to the recipe to be safe. Pop them in the oven, and an hour later, you'll have two steaming loaves of perfectly delicious pumpkin bread. Just one more step before you enjoy them, and be sure not to skip it because it really elevates the texture. Rub a tablespoon of butter over each of your still hot loaves, spreading it evenly. Then mix together sugar and cinnamon before sprinkling it evenly over the tops. Now you're done. The hardest part is trying to be patient enough to let them cool before enjoying a slice. I am so incredibly grateful that Denise shared her recipe in her community's cookbook so I can enjoy it today. It really is perfect in the most delicious, nostalgic, and rustic way. So while this cools and before I show you a delicious no-bake twist on a pumpkin pie with a praline crunchy twist, Let's talk about one of the most common questions I get asked when it comes to baking with pumpkin. Is fresh baked better than canned? So you love pumpkin everything and you're ready to celebrate pumpkin spice season by baking your favorite pumpkin recipe. Then you probably walked by that bin of adorable ornamental pumpkins and wondered at least one time, should I bake my own instead of use canned? Will it be better? I mean, it has to be better. Everything's better fresh baked over factory canned, right? Well, that's an interesting and more complicated question than you might think. Mostly because of our inherent misunderstanding of what a pumpkin even is. See, it might surprise you, but for the most part, a true pumpkin would make a terrible pie. Believe it or not, the best pumpkin desserts are made from squash, like this. Yeah, butternut squash makes an amazing pumpkin pie. While this adorable classic only really is good for jack-o'-lanterns and decorating tables. But there really is no need to go too far into the convoluted science that is the difference between a pumpkin and a squash. All you really need to know is from a culinary standpoint, there really is no difference. 
When it comes to baking, stop thinking of only the big, bright orange classics you carved as a kid. And instead, think of pale green and pastel peach squash varieties. Open your mind to all the possibilities and you will find an amazing variety of pumpkin options at your fingertips, maybe even year round. So before you start the ambitious journey of fresh baked over canned, you just have to wrap your head around what varieties to bake with and what to avoid. Fortunately, there are several varieties you can find easily that are plenty sweet and flavorful. You just have to know what to look for. So first, learn what to avoid. And the first red flag is a big pumpkin. For the most part, the best baking pumpkins are on the small side. My mom always said, if you want a tasty fruit, get the ugly one. And she was right. Big, giant, showy pumpkins look great on your front doorstep, but for the most part are terrible to cook with. They just weren't developed for taste. They were developed for size and color and all sorts of other factors. So avoid anything over 10 pounds or so, as a general rule. Next, avoid anything with thin walls of flesh. You won't be able to tell until you actually cut into it, but for the most part, if a pumpkin has thin, firm flesh, then they were probably developed so they don't take much water to grow and to make the perfect jack-o'-lantern, not the perfect pie. So now that you know what to avoid, it's time to learn what to look for. First is the easiest. They have names like pie pumpkin or sugar pumpkin. And if you chose those, you'd be okay. But surprisingly, they're not the best. For a really great baking pumpkin, you're better off looking for a variety that looks a little bit more like squash. Pale peachy orange varieties, like what I chose to bake with, the New England cheese, are easy to find, usually cheap, and very easy to identify. Or even white, like the Ghost Pumpkin or Lumina. Both have great flavor and sweetness. Then there's the Cinderella Pumpkin, a trendy variety that's easy to spot based on its unique color and shape, but trendy often means expensive, making them a little impractical. And don't forget about butternut squash. I wasn't kidding about it being one of the best baking pumpkins out there. Plus they are inexpensive and very easy to find even year round. In fact, some canned pumpkin companies use them in their blend, which may lead you to the question of what variety of pumpkin do canned pumpkin companies use? The most popular brand, Libby, uses a variety called Dickinson, a pale orange variety that you usually won't be able to find in stores for one very simple reason. It's not cute. They are tall and skinny, so you can't really set them upright for decorating. They just fall over. And they're a dull, pale orange with little to offer aesthetically, which should be your first clue. They're probably tasty. So when it comes to hunting for a baking pumpkin, open your mind to non-traditional pumpkins that look more like squash and find one that you can source easily for a great price and you're sure to have success. So you've chosen your variety and you are ready to bake, ready to test your theory to see if the extra work of home-baked fresh pumpkin is worth it. So how do you do it? Very simply. If you're not gonna save your seeds, you can literally just poke your pumpkin a few times with a sharp knife and pop it in the oven for about an hour at 400 degrees, depending on the size. But I think pumpkin seeds are one of the best things to come out of pumpkins, so I always save mine. If you'd like to save yours as well, just cut the top off your pumpkin like you would if you were carving and scoop all the seeds out. Pop the top back on and bake it at 400 degrees for about an hour until the flesh is very tender. Just that simple. Cooking pumpkins is more awkward than difficult. The labor is in the cleaning, not in any technique. Be sure to let them cool before you scoop out all that tasty flesh. And just like that, you are ready to enjoy baking with your first fresh baked pumpkin. So is it worth the extra work? Well, the first question to answer would be, is it tastier? Yes. If you pick the right variety, fresh baked pumpkin can have more pumpkiny flavor and richer sweetness. But if you choose the wrong variety, it can have almost no sweetness at all and even be watery and stringy. So yes, if you choose wisely and no, if you don't. But I think it comes down to one factor more than anything. Does hunting down a unique variety of pumpkin 
scooping out and roasting fresh pumpkin seeds and baking your first truly homemade pumpkin pie sound fun to you? If it does, then of course it's worth it. But if all you see is a mess to clean up, then no, it's not worth it at all. Canned pumpkin is consistent, reliable, inexpensive, and still very tasty. So if baking a pumpkin isn't something you would just do for fun anyway, then stick to canned. At the end of the day, we'll both be enjoying a delicious slice of pumpkin spice something. And that's all that really matters. So what do you think? Would you bake your own pumpkin? Or does it seem like too much trouble? Have you before? Or have you always wanted to? I would love your opinion on the canned versus fresh debate, so be sure to comment below. Now I'm off to sneak my third slice of pumpkin bread while I whip up some delicious praline pumpkin pie. So let's get to it. A no-bake praline twist on a classic. This pumpkin mousse pie sprinkled with crunchy pecan praline pieces is divine. Traditional custard pumpkin pie is one of my favorites, but there are plenty of really great recipes out there. And some people get a little turned off by the texture of custard. So I was super excited when I found this recipe in one of my vintage cookbooks for New Orleans praline pumpkin pie. It's absolutely delicious with a light fluffy texture and topped with sweet, crunchy pecan praline candy pieces. So if you're looking for an alternative to the traditional, I'll show you how to make this delicious pie. To begin, you'll need to be prepared with a baked and cooled nine inch pie crust. I used a traditional butter pastry crust I whipped up, but a graham cracker crust would be delicious too, and easier if pastry intimidates you at all. Set that aside while you make your praline crunch. It's remarkably easy and fast to make. All you need is butter, sugar, and pecans in a cast iron skillet over medium heat. I strongly recommend a high quality cast iron pan since it will help prevent burning. It cooks very quickly, like less than three minutes, especially on an induction, so don't step away or stop stirring. As soon as the sugar is a bubbling golden brown, remove it from the heat and immediately pour it onto a buttered nonstick surface. You can use foil, parchment paper, but I used my sill pad, which worked beautifully. Set it aside to cool while you whip up the filling. To begin, combine gelatin and cold water in a small saucepan. Slowly warm it until all the gelatin is dissolved. Transfer the melted gelatin to a large mixing bowl and add brown sugar, blending them together well. Then add pumpkin, milk, salt, cinnamon, and nutmeg. Stir them all together until well mixed. Then set that aside to whip up some fresh whipping cream. Whip the cream into stiff peaks. Then scrape that into the pumpkin mixture. Gently fold in the whipped cream, slowly stirring to keep as much of the fluffy cream texture as possible. And just like that, you're all done with the filling. Check to make sure your praline has cooled before breaking it into small pieces. Sprinkle about two thirds of it in the bottom of your cooled pie crust, then top with the pumpkin mousse filling. Once all the filling is transferred, sprinkle with the remaining praline pieces. All done. The recipe recommends letting it sit overnight in the fridge and it does help immensely with cutting and serving. And even though it's technically edible right away, I'm glad I chilled mine because I was pleasantly surprised how easy it was to cut a pretty piece. The mousse really firms up well, which is rare for a pie like this. So I'd follow their advice and make it the day before. I hope you enjoyed this unique recipe. I know I enjoyed eating it. The crunchy praline pieces added such fun texture and the fluffy mousse was a deliciously light spin on traditional pumpkin pie without sacrificing any of the rich flavors that you crave with pumpkin spice desserts. So now that you've enjoyed a tasty pumpkin pie, it's time to celebrate another pumpkin dessert, the Humble Pumpkin Cobbler. It's a celebration of the best parts of both pie and cake that's super easy to make and sure to be a crowd pleaser. Pie or cake? Why choose when you can have them both? Pumpkin pie cake will satisfy both the gooey pie lovers and the fluffy cake fans. A rich pumpkin custard topped with a buttery cake crumble. It's essentially a pumpkin cobbler 
and it couldn't be easier to make. If you're looking for a tasty pumpkin spice treat that will be easy to make and satisfy every sweet tooth at the table, look no further. This vintage recipe I found inside of one of my vintage community cookbooks was submitted by Deanna McDonald, and I am so grateful she shared it. To make it, crack eggs into a large mixing bowl, whisking them lightly before adding pumpkin, sugar, salt, cinnamon, ginger, cloves, and evaporated milk. The recipe called for one large can of evaporated milk, which can be a little confusing because can sizes were different when this cookbook was made. Based on my research and after some practice, I think it meant the 24 ounce can. Once all the wet ingredients are well mixed, pour them into a casserole dish. Then set that aside while you make the topping by simply combining a box of yellow cake mix with butter. Roughly blend the butter pieces into the box of yellow cake mix, leaving plenty of big pieces. No need to overmix. This is a perfect recipe to use a batch of my homemade boxed cake mix, so I will leave a link below if you haven't already watched it. Sprinkle that on top of the wet ingredients, then top with a handful of chopped nuts. That's it. All done. Ready to go in the oven. After about an hour, you'll be able to enjoy a rich, satisfying pumpkin spice treat. The recipe says to bake for 50 minutes, but mine took a little bit longer, so be patient with it. It's totally worth the wait. I am so grateful Deanna shared her amazing recipe in her community's cookbook. And now it's time to bake our last pumpkin spice recipe, and it's a beauty, pumpkin cake roll. But before we do, I have been talking about pumpkin spice flavor a lot lately, so I wanted to address something that came up recently. I was chatting with a friend and the obligatory seasonal subject of pumpkin spice came up. So I naturally asked them if they had had a chance to enjoy their first pumpkin spice latte yet. And their answer was no, I hate pumpkin. So this got me thinking, does everyone think there's pumpkin flavor in pumpkin spice? Do people know that pumpkin spice is just the spices they go in to flavor pumpkin pie, not the actual flavor of pumpkin? Maybe not. So here's a friendly PSA. Pumpkin spice is not pumpkin flavored. It's just the standard spices you would find in pumpkin pie and most other baked pumpkin treats. Specifically a blend of cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, and sometimes cloves, allspice, or mace. Conveniently pre-blended to save you from having to buy a bunch of different spices. That's all. So if you hate pumpkin, don't worry, you can still enjoy a pumpkin spice latte. So now that we've cleared the air on that, it's time to get back to baking. Is there any dessert prettier than a cake roll? All pumpkin desserts are pretty much delicious, but very few will win beauty contests. Not the case with a pumpkin cake roll. You can enjoy all that delicious pumpkin spice flavor and have a showstopper on the table. Talk about having your cake and eating it too. And did I mention cream cheese frosting? I know cake rolls can be intimidating and seem technical, but this recipe was super easy, so even if you've never made a cake roll before, give it a try. It's really rewarding to make such a beautiful dessert. And speaking of a beautiful presentation, I wanted to experiment with some different decorating techniques, so I made two smaller rolls, and I could not be happier with how they came out, especially the lace one. More on how I decorated them at the end, so stick around if you're interested. To make this recipe, all you need to do is start by combining your dry ingredients. That's flour, baking powder, cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, and a pinch of salt. Whisk them together well, then set that aside while you get out your mixer. Combine eggs and sugar and cream until light and fluffy. Then add pumpkin and lemon juice. Combine those well before you scrape into your dry ingredients. As with most cake recipes, avoid overmixing. Just blend until smooth. Now it's time to transfer to a cookie sheet. I used two smaller cookie sheets, as I mentioned earlier, but you can use one standard cookie sheet. Line the sheet with parchment paper, leaving a bit of overhang off each end, which will make it easier to remove the cake after baking. Be sure to spread the batter as evenly as possible and all the way to the corners of the sheet. 
Once I'm done spreading the batter as evenly as I can get it, I even lift it off the table by a few inches and drop it down flat, which helps finish flattening out any uneven areas and work out any air bubbles that may be hiding under the surface. All set, you're ready to bake. It cooks very quickly and you don't want to overbake it or it will crack when rolling, so keep a close eye on it. As soon as it's out of the oven, while it's still warm, carefully begin rolling the cake up from the short end of the cookie sheet while peeling it off the parchment paper. Go slowly and roll it tightly without squishing it though. Don't worry about frosting yet. You're simply training it to roll while it cools. Set the cake aside to cool while you whip up the frosting. To make the cream cheese frosting in a mixer, combine powdered sugar with softened cream cheese and butter. Then add vanilla and whip on high until it's light and fluffy. Back when this recipe was written, cream cheese packages were only three ounces, so the recipe calls for two packages, which totals six ounces. Nowadays, cream cheese comes in an eight ounce package, so rather than shave off two ounces, I just increased how much frosting I made by two ounces, increasing the powdered sugar and the vanilla by a bit. After all, you can never have too much cream cheese frosting. Once the frosting is done and the cake is cooled, carefully unroll it. Don't worry about getting it to lay flat. Let it keep the curled shape as much as you can. You should be able to spread the frosting evenly, even if it isn't perfectly flat. Make sure the frosting is spread all the way to the edge and as smooth as you can get it before you begin rolling up the cake from the same end you started with the first time. Take your time and don't squish the frosting out, but do press firmly to make sure the roll stays even. Once it's completely rolled up, feel free to roll it back and forth a few times to make sure it has an even and symmetrical shape and make sure the frosting fills out the ends well by sticking a small piece of parchment paper to each end and patting them on a flat table surface gently. All done? Hopefully you won't, but don't panic if you have a few small cracks. Most decoration will cover up any minor flaws. Now it's time for the fun part. If you're nervous about decorating or in a hurry, you can do something as simple as a sprinkle of powdered sugar and a candy pumpkin. The dark orange color of the cake contrasts beautifully with snowy white powdered sugar, so a simple dusting is surprisingly beautiful. But if you're feeling ambitious and want to try something new, I was so happy how my laced powdered sugar decoration came out. All you have to do is wrap the roll tightly in a lace fabric or doily, and then sprinkle generously with powdered sugar. It's so simple to do and absolutely stunning. I couldn't believe how cute it came out. Whatever your preference for decorating, be creative, have fun, and do what you're comfortable with. Either way, you'll have a tasty cake roll to enjoy. I found this roll is actually much tastier the next day, which is odd for a cake. But the cake has to be a very particular texture to roll well, which can be almost too dry, but letting it sit in the fridge overnight allows the cream cheese frosting to hydrate the cake a bit, improving the texture and the taste. Overall, it's a delicious pumpkin spice centerpiece, perfect for celebrating a special occasion with friends and family. Thank you so much for joining me to celebrate pumpkin spice season with these amazing vintage pumpkin recipes. The perfect pumpkin bread, delicious praline pumpkin pie, a crowd-pleasing pumpkin cobbler, and a showstopper pumpkin cake roll. I hope they inspired you to appreciate these humble spiral-bound community cookbooks and cook more old recipes.